Good evening, everybody, and a thousand welcomes. Gia Yves Galair, a coed dogs faultis, flitter roev, huigan o coed special to show. Fomit harve, wiach, div as ocht, a vehelaverlin, a nocht. So I am Mary Gallagher. I am Professor of French Studies in UCD's School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. And I am the convener of APREN, or APREN, UCD's Asia Pacific Research Network. On behalf of UCD, and especially on behalf of the APREN organizing team, I'd like to thank you for tuning in on this November evening to what is the last APREN seminar gathering of 2021. We are really um, very fortunate um, and are very grateful to be welcoming this evening for our last talk of the year, um, Professor Nathan Hill. Professor Hill is Sam Lam, Professor in Chinese Studies at Trinity College Dublin. He wears the hat of a director of the Trinity Centre for Asian Studies. His PhD was awarded by Harvard in 2009. And prior to coming to Dublin, Professor Hill taught in London, where he headed the Department of East Asian Languages um, at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. He was also director of the London Confucius Institute. So uh, Professor Hill's research fields are Tibetan linguistics, the history of Chinese, Tibetan uh, Burm, Burm, Burmese, uh, comparative linguistics. I've written Burman here, I think, I think that might be correct. Um, and he also has a research interest in natural language processing uh, for low resource languages. Professor Hill's uh, research projects have been funded by the ERC, the AHRC in the UK and the British Academy. And they have been in the fields of Tibet Tibeto-Burman uh, historical linguistics and also Sino-Tibetan historical linguistics. His most recent book appeared with Cambridge University Press in 2019 and uh, the title is Historical Phonology um, of Tibetan, Burmese and Chinese. Um, other titles from 2010, Tibetan Verb Stems and from uh, 2009, Old Tibetan Inscriptions. Professor Hill's title this evening um, has nothing to do, I think, with verb stems or <laughs> Tibetan inscriptions, but um, it, I think it's going to take us on a very interesting journey. Um, it is the Chinese state's approach to the national question in the 20th century. So thank you so much, Nathan, for coming to speak to us this evening, and I, uh, I give you Professor Nathan Hill. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mary, for this kind uh, introduction. And um, maybe I should begin by by uh, explaining that I, I've slightly uh, changed the scope of the talk. And, and first, I'll explain the reason for that. Uh, around the time I was hired at uh, Trinity, there was some uh, some discussion of the uh, of China's approach to the national question in the pages of the Irish Times that I uh, myself uh, weighed in on. And um, and, uh, and Mary actually uh, kind of sort of in the aftermath of, uh, of those discussions um, issued this invitation and I was uh, too lazy to uh, immediately uh, take it up. So, so, so there's been, you know, uh, maybe six months of, uh, of time that I permitted myself to, to prepare it. Uh, and in the meantime, actually, I have organized a series of uh, talks at TCD that has touched on uh, some of the same questions. So in particular, Ju uh, Julia Schneider of, of, of University College Cork, that gave a very interesting talk about um, the, the, the Republican period in China. And then we've had several people speak about uh, the recent Xi period. So then I had sort of, you know, um, 
to some extent, uh, you know, taken, I don't know, take, take, taken out the, the, the support from underneath my own uh, planned presentation. So uh, what I'm going to do tonight is to zoom out a little bit and, um, and talk about uh, the, the national question in, in slightly broader uh, terms, and then, and then we'll sort of travel towards uh, China in the 20th century. Uh, and I should, should excuse myself that then it's a very broad uh, scope and uh, involves a, a number of topics that I'm myself not particularly expert in. So I'm, uh, you know, just uh, learning, uh, but I, I see a kind of uh, story uh, that can be told. And if uh, uh, any of you feel like uh, I have grossly uh, misrepresented some some thing that you know more about, then you can please kindly, uh, you know, correct me at the end. So I'm going to start uh, my story with, um, with uh, the word nation, which comes from uh, Latin, natio. It's a, it's a, it's a, a noun that's, that's, uh, that comes from a, a denominative verb uh, and means to be born, the, the, the verb. And in uh, sort of in, in, in Latin texts, uh, it could mean uh, people, tribe, family, any kind of uh, group, that uh, maybe has some uh, commonality uh, to do with birthplace in particular, but not only. It, it might be a sort of people with a shared interest, for instance, like a, even like a hobby. Yeah, uh, but uh, particularly in, in in Cicero and in the Church Fathers, uh, a nation, as opposed to other words like uh, familia or gens or something, meant uh, foreigners or Gentiles. So uh, in terms of the nation becoming a sort of social political reality, uh, this happens in, um, in, in late 12th century, early 13th century Bologna uh, at the founding of the University of Bologna, where uh, many students from outside of the city of Bologna had come to study. Uh, and they found it useful to organize uh, basically in their struggles with the, the city fathers uh, into, uh, into nations. So um, there, were, there were 14, or, or it depended on the time period, 13, 14 nations in the, uh, called the Ultramontane University. And then there was also a Cismontane University. So the Cismontane University was for all those nations from, from Italy. And then the Ultramontane University was for all those nations from the other side of the Alps. So you had, nations like uh, France, Spain, Provençal, Picard, Normandy. And, and what were these nations? They were, they were a group of students from that area uh, that had, um, had, a, had a, a function in the administration of the university. The university was a collection of nations and they were uh, democratically organized uh, they had they had you know um, legal rights uh, within the, recognized by the city and importantly tying back to this this notion of foreigners citizens of Bologna studying at the university were not members of a nation because because they were under the jurisdiction of the city so that's how you get this understanding that nation as foreigner comes to mean nation as um, you know uh, group of students organized for the purposes of university administration. Uh, according to uh, where they were from. And actually uh, in um, the, the best documented nation from Bologna is the, is the German nation. And in, uh, in 1306, the rule was, it was based on your birthplace. Uh, but in 1417, uh, uh, the rule was, it had to do with your native language, particularly in the, in the German nation, which covered uh, Bohemia and covered Hungary. It was a huge uh, territory. Um, so, so that's where we get that, you know, that's, we get the first manifestation of, of nation as a, as a social political category for the organization of, of human beings. Uh, and it enters into, um, let's say international politics through ecclesiastical councils. So the first ecclesiastical council where bishops voted according to nation, rather than just sort of each bishop has one vote. Uh, was uh, at the Council of Constance 
in, uh, in, which lasted from 1414 to 1418. Uh, but this actually culminated a tra trajectory. So, so um, sort of, uh, you, you can sort of distinguish three phases. Uh, at first, it was just convenient for lobbying purposes for, um, for the curia or the Pope to sort of meet bishops by nation, right? It makes sense. Like French bishops have some things in common, maybe some shared interests. Uh, you can't meet all the bishops to, to lobby uh, individually. So you, you, you meet them for lobbying purposes according to nation. And then at the Council of Pisa, which is the one right before Constance, uh, voting was according to nation in the sense of calling upon bishops to cast their votes according to nation. This is like the, I don't, I mean, as an American, I compare it to uh, like the democratic uh, convention where you call on, uh, you know, Vermont, and then you say, uh, who do you cast your votes for? But, but it's, but they don't just have one vote as Vermont, you know, each delegate has a vote. So that's how things were in Pisa. Uh, but in Constance, it was each nation gets exactly one vote. And I can't uh, 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 help but sharing a, a, a fact that um, kind of two thirds of the way through the council, uh, the French delegates uh, were of the opinion that England was too small to, uh, to, to, to constitute a nation. And then the English, uh, or let's say the bishops, you know, who, who constituted the English nation uh, wrote a rebuttal uh, where where a lot of their argument uh, for uh, for England counting as a nation uh, involved uh, that it was composed of many kingdoms, like you know in the same way that Germany or France was composed of many kingdoms, uh, eight kingdoms in particular, four of them uh, from Ireland. So you know I think uh, that's I don't know I found that a a, a fact worth uh, telling this uh, this audience about. So, uh, so then we have already, you know, uh, we have the, the nation goes from a, uh, an organizational unit for university administration. And then clearly, you know, because these bishops, many of them had been trained in universities, they brought that idea to, to the, the, the forum of international politics. Now, uh, the next step is to actually to, to, to change the political jurisdiction of the world to reflect nations. And uh, this is a process that I don't know uh, very much about, but I think it can be addressed uh, in, in, in a theoretical and a historical way. So I'll start with the theoretical, which is, um, uh, it's, it's clearly tied to the rise of capitalism. Uh, and why, we can ask ourselves, is the nation state a useful form of political organization for for capitalism, and there's a big literature here, but I'm just going to rely uh, on um, Rosa Luxemburg because I, I I find that she has a pretty good answer. Uh, where the um, key factors include uh, the creation of a home market. So it, in a in in one of these you know nested political regimes of uh, of feudalism, you had trade barriers everywhere. Uh, but for capitalism, it's useful to, to flatten out and have sort of free market areas. Uh, and so the creation of the home market was, was an important consideration in, um, in the organization of, of, of political and social life into nation states. And then the other one was uh, the, the exercise of legal violence at the nation state level. Uh, so on the one hand, you want, if you're a member of the bourgeoisie, you want uh, your life to be peaceful, right? You, you want to be able to not <laughs> hire your own soldiers to watch your house. Um, but on the other hand, you also want to be able to use uh, the army to, uh, to open up markets abroad uh, and to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to help your um, interests, your commercial and uh, economic interests. So that's, that's her um, argument for why the nation state is a sort of good uh, form of social organization for, under, for capitalism. And then how does it come to be? Well, I think it's pretty clear that it starts in England and I won't go into the details, but uh, you know, the War of the Roses sort of gives you, the, the, the result of the War of the Roses is that it's clear that only one uh, person has uh, legal jurisdiction over the use of violence in the territory. You get the dissolution of the monasteries, which uh, kind of flattens out land ownership uh, structures around, uh, well, and and um, 
and and create sort of pri more private holdings in in land. And then this process, uh, let's say, really significantly uh, results in the civil war, where um, you can really say, you know, the budding capitalist farmer class takes over the state. Uh, and then uh, in, in the same breath, we can mention the Dutch Revolution, the French Revolution. And by now, it's, it's pretty clear that, that the nation state as an organizational form is on the march. And then I think uh, you have two, uh, two sort of forms of political organization on the global stage in, let's say, the 17th uh, century to the early 19th century. And those are um, the nation states, so England, France, Holland, and then uh, Germany and, and Italy, which, which bring together small uh, polities to, to, to match some preconceived notion of a nation. And then you also have uh, large multinational empires. So uh, the Ottomans and uh, the Austrians and the Russians and the Chinese. These are all you know, vast uh, multinational empires. And, um, and the sort of idea of the nation state, the ideology of the nation state would require that they be carved up into their constituent nations. And that process, I think, probably begins with the independence of Greece uh, from the Ottoman Empire and really culminates in the, in the Fourth World War, where, where both the Ottoman Empire and, um, uh, and uh, Austria, and to a lesser extent, Russia, are, are carved up into their constituent uh, nations, each, each one or maybe not each one, but many of them <laughs> getting their own states. So um, now is, is where I want to jump to uh, the, the national question in, uh, in international socialism, which is going to very clearly inform the Chinese context. So um, uh, the sort of in, in those days, uh, there was something called the social democracy, uh, which meant, uh, which was explicitly Marxist, and it was only later that uh, that social democracy split into the more reformist uh, kind of uh, approach that we now associate with the word social democracy and 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 uh, communism. So before that split, uh, we we talked internationally about the the social democracy, and there was a discussion. Where, where it's it's clear that on the one hand, socialism was sort of on the side of the underdog in general, that's the sort of idea. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it was meant to be international. Um, and, and I just want to highlight what I see as a sort of, you know, to, to really use a, a Marxist term, a contradiction imminent in socialism from the beginning, which is uh, even the articulation of being international uh, prescribes the idea of, of the nation in itself. And uh, for instance, in, in the organization of the first international, so the, 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 um, the International Working Men's Association, there were delegates from different nations. There was a you know, French delegate and a German delegate and whatnot. So at the same time that, that as, a, as a political goal, the uh, obliteration of the nation state as a form of social organization was in sight that 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 you know concept of uh, the nation state was actually inscribed into their own uh, practice. So uh, so there was a debate within uh, social democracy about what what should we you know how should we approach the national question, uh, and then there were very specific national questions: uh, how should we approach the Polish question? How should we approach the Irish question? Uh, and uh, some people thought it should really be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it's argued that this was the approach of, of, of uh, Marx and Engels, and it certainly was the approach of Rosa Luxemburg, that you had to, you had to look at a struggle for national liberation, and you had to say, you know, is this particular struggle on the side of uh, progress in history? Is it progressive or is it regressive? Is it reactionary? And, and size up the, the concrete circumstances on the ground. But um, the official policy uh, of uh, social democratic parties um, 
you know, led by the Social, Democrat, Social Democratic Party of Germany, uh, let's say before, the, at the very end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, was that uh, nations sh should have the right to self-determination. And then I will uh, talk specifically about an essay called uh, Marxism and the National Question by Joseph Stalin from 1913, which is you know, significantly before the Russian Revolution, where, uh, so he was Georgian and it, uh, partly because of that, because he was a, a member of a, of, of a minority nationality, uh, Lenin called on him to sort of write the position paper for, um, for what the Bolshevik uh, position should be on the national question. And, uh, and what he said was that uh, uh, nations sh sh should have, you know, he re reiterated the orthodox position basically, nations should have the right to self-determination, including secession uh, if, they, if they wanted. Uh, they should have uh, the right to uh, education in their in their own language, uh, and if they choose to be part of larger polities such as Russia, they would have the right to local autonomy. Uh, but um, it should be noted that uh, he saw that as necessarily territorially continu contiguous. So uh, in particular, the context of his 1913 paper was uh, against this organization called the Bund, which was uh, a, 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 a social demo democratic organization uh, primarily, or no, no, exclusively organized around, uh, or for the, for the benefit of the Jews living in, in Russia, who argued that you, know, you, you could be Jewish and live anywhere in Russia. There was no specific territory to point to um, but uh, in, in this article, Stalin was saying that that um, uh, local autonomy sh should really be tied to a jurisdiction, uh, and you know everyone in that jurisdiction would then collectively exercise that local autonomy, rather than having sort of an ID card that says you know you're a Georgian but you're living in uh, I don't know Kazakhstan you still vote with the Georgians he didn't like that idea at all so that was the the position uh, that Stalin articulated in 1913 and then that was adopted uh, by the Communist Party of China and um, now I should just make a slight digression and say that uh, that in the Qing Dynasty, um, the, uh, the, the Qing recognized, and I sort of don't know what term to use here because I don't want to say nation, I don't want to say ethnic group, right? Um, but uh, the, the Qing organized itself with a recognition that the, the Manchus, the Mongols, uh, the Tibetans, the Uyghur, and the Chinese, those five peoples uh, all had a, a distinct constitutional, if you like, relationship to the state. And that was kind of similar to Austria and the Ottoman Empire. Um, so I won't dwell on it, but you know, the, the, the Manchus were in charge and they were organized into banners. They lived in special plate, parts of town. They had a special haircut um, uh, and they, they tried very hard to maintain their linguistic and, and cultural identity despite uh, being uh, very thin on the ground and and all you know knowing Chinese and being spread out throughout China, uh, the Mongols and the Tibetans had um, a, a lot of scope for uh, local decision making. Let's say uh, the Uyghurs had been only recently incorporated into the state and were clearly the sort of um, the sort of extra group. So just by way of example, there's a large uh, dictionary uh, 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 um, compiled under the Shangxi Emperor, uh, which, which gave words in, uh, in the first edition, gave words in, in the four languages, uh, Chinese, Mongolian, Tibetan, uh, and, uh, and Manchu. Uh, but then they came out with a later edition that added Uyghur. And I think that's a nice metaphor for how the state kind of conceptualized uh, the Uyghurs. Uh, and then the other groups that we would we would now see as national minorities, or or um, or I should have said minority nationalities, 
uh, like the Hani or the Yi or the Lisu in mostly in Yunnan, uh, were were really kind of off the Qing Dynasty's radar and and were were considered as others, yeah. And 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 there's a book, for instance, that is sort of illustrated book of peoples of the world, and it has you know about a hundred. Um, peoples like this in it, but also includes, you know, the French and the Dutch and sort of other uh, peoples of the world. Yeah. Uh, then in, in the in in when the Qing Dynasty was overthrown, those uh, Chinese nationalists who saw themselves as uh, or saw that as an important goal, uh, conceptualized in terms of uh, anti-colonial national liberation struggle, we need to cast off uh, the yoke of the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Manchu oppressors in the same way that we have to cast off the yoke of the English uh, and the French. And then there was a question, of course, how shall we relate to the other nations that uh, live inside of China? And, the, and uh, let me just say that in the Republican period, there were multiple views on that question, uh, ranging from let them have their own nation states to, um, to they must all become Chinese. Uh, and the the Republic of China never really had the the stability, the control on the ground to both effectively articulate a coherent, uh, let's say, position on uh, the the national question, uh, nor to implement it. But the uh, the the, Chi the the Chinese Communist Party, uh, when they came to power in 1949, they had made their position clear that that it was the position that Stalin had articulated in 1913. So the first uh, thing they then had to do was figure out how many nations uh, they were governing. So, uh, oh, and I should say that they, they, they had already by this time promised that, uh, that the minority nationalities would be given uh, representation in the People's Congress according to population. Uh, before they knew how many they, they were going to be. So then they conducted a census and, and in, in a, in, in, in using a methodology that would be approved of by many people today, uh, they, they left uh, the, the question, what uh, nationality are you, open. So you could write anything, you could, say, you could answer anything. Um, and the result is that they got a little over 400 different answers. Now, 14 of those uh, included... Uh, over 100,000 people, uh, so uh, uh, including things like, um, uh, I mean, well, certainly Tibetan, but also uh, things like Hmong or Zhuang. Um, but uh, as many as 20 of these uh, of these answers, only one person gave. Uh, and, and there was also an other. Uh, uh, you know, option that, or like you, you could write anything, right? So, so how many people wrote other? Yeah, or uh, it was uh, over 30,000 people who, who did that. Uh, so when they looked at this and they said, well, now with this isn't going to work, if we give these 20 nations that only have one person in them equal, you know, proportional representation in the, in the, uh, in the, in the People's Congress, then every single Chinese citizen is going to have to sit in the People's Congress. And that's not, it's not going to work. So then they, uh, the state sort of told the ethnographers, okay, go back and, and uh, revise this list to, to have fewer. Yeah. And they did that under enormous time pressure and came up with this list of uh, 56 that uh, are in use now. And um, particularly important in doing that in Yunnan was the work of the, uh, the British colonial officer and amateur linguist, H.P. Uh, Davies, who had compiled uh, word lists from throughout uh, Yunnan and, and had sort of argued that because these people's uh, words are similar to these people, you could kind of glom together various um, groups uh, into, into larger groups. So this was a consultative process. So it wasn't like the state just said, okay, you guys, you're in this, in this uh, Minzu, uh, but uh, sorry, uh, uh, nation. But um, but but you know if 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 you if you were too low down on the list of numbers, then you basically had to decide which which uh, of the larger nations you uh, wanted to belong to. And there are some strange uh, results from this. Um, 
for example, uh, there's one village uh, in Yunnan uh, where, where there's a people called the Katso uh, who decided uh, for reasons having to do with their own sense of identity uh, and, and the history of their, of their uh, uh, ruling um, dynasty, uh, that they would be classified as Mongols, even though uh, they lived am among people who ended up being classified as Yi. Um, it, it, from a linguistic perspective, you can look at the Low Lowish uh, family of the Low Lowish lang language family. It has four distinct branches. Uh, so some of those branches are, are, uh, have multiple nations in them, like the Hani and the Jino. Uh, but then a nation like the Yi actually includes speakers of uh, languages across those four branches. And then in those in situations like that, one language, in this case, Nosu, was was chosen as the language for that nation. Um, so, so um, yeah, so, uh, you know, China has over 400 uh, languages spoken in it, uh, but only 56 of them are sort of recognized by the state. And, and even in the, in the practice of, of, um, of linguistics in China, it's kind of politically correct to, to not say that things are, different languages than the official language of their Minzu. Uh, to give one example, there's a family, the, the Gyaronic family, uh, which is spoken, there's about seven, seven, or seven to 12 languages in the Gyaronic family. Uh, and it's, it's manifestly as related to Tibetan as it is to Chinese or Burmese. It's, it's kind of part of that same sino tibetan family, but, um, but very interesting and divergent. Uh, but the Gyarong speakers are classified as, as Tibetan. So uh, as, uh, the sort of social reality on the ground is that the Gyarongs uh, are, are understood by Tibetans as speaking kind of bad Tibetan. Uh, and uh, quickly, uh, depending on where you live in the Gyarong speaking area, people are switching either to Amdo Tibetan or to uh, Mandarin Chinese. So just a few words about um, how nationalist policy worked, you know, uh, both in theory and in practice, there are some. There was. There have been some benefits to being a, a member of a minority nationality. Uh, those in, included uh, regional autonomy, and and that manifested in in things like the the governor of your province or or prefecture would be a member of uh, your ethnicity. Uh, you would be given extra points on the college entrance exam. Uh, you could also, there's a special sort of uh, college preparatory year uh, available between high school and university for, um, for members of, of uh, minority nationalities. Uh, there are quotas uh, for government jobs in, um, in, uh, in uh, regional, in, 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 in autonomous uh, national regions, uh, and, and, and the rules about how those quotas are filled uh, are set uh, at the at the local level. So, for instance, in, in Inner Mongolia, there's you know so many percentage uh, that the, the, that of government jobs for Mongolians, and and there in Inner Mongolia, they've decided that to qualify for that, you have to speak Mongolian. Uh, whereas um, uh, in other regions, uh, there are still those quotas for government jobs, but there's no requirement uh, to speak uh, the local language. And then also uh, the one child policy was, uh, was not applied to, um, to members of uh, minority nationalities. Um, some people will say that uh, a lot of these measures are, were sort of existed in paper only or, um, or, or let's, how to put it, that, um, that, that the, the, the minority nationalities have not exercised real autonomy I think what is most clear is that the right to secede, uh, which uh, the Communist Party was perfectly happy to see Outer Mongolia exercise in, in, uh, in I think it was in the early 30s when they did that, um, th that right is, is no longer considered uh, something that, uh, that, that, that nationalities should exercise. Um, other than that, I, I, would, I would say from my perspective that um, the, the, the thing that constitutes the non-freedom of uh, national minorities is the one party uh, system, which applies equally across China. Yeah, so, and that these things, these policies like uh, extra points 
on college admissions, you know, did have a concrete meaning to, to those people who, who, um, who they applied to. Um, a, a lot of this was sort of not really applied during the Cultural Revolution, because in, during the Cultural Revolution, everyone had a lot other things on their mind. But, but uh, in the sort of late 70s, uh, or you know, in 79, early 80s, uh, I think there was a, a renewed attempt, both also in, in legislation, to, to stick by the policies uh, from, you know, implied by the 1913 Article of Stalin's. Uh, um, but uh, starting in the in the sort of mid to late 2000s, uh, when there were sort of ethnic violence in in Tibet and in Xinjiang, uh, certain members of the Chinese uh, intelligentsia uh, started to articulate the opinion that. Uh, this framework, this, this, this traditional approach to the national question was no longer fit for purpose. And there's two schools of thought there that are, that are most worth mentioning. Uh, one is associated with Marong, uh, who argued that uh, China should have a kind of melting pot, uh, a sort of civic society where, where um, national identity uh, would melt away uh, in, and be replaced with a loyalty to the, um, to the state. And to to a to a new nationality called the Zhonghua Minzu. I mean, it, it had been articulated from the beginning of the of the of the republic and and even earlier, uh, but no one really goes around thinking I'm uh, Zhonghua. They think I'm Chinese or I'm Tibetan, um, and that any exercise of of, of difference would be relegated to, to your private life. Yeah, you know, you can speak Tibetan in at home. You can go to your Buddhist. Monasteries, uh, you know, uh, by without having it uh, interfere with the public sphere. The other thinkers were were two people with the last name Hu, who co-authored co-author, an article. So they're called in literature the two Hu's, and and they had a more uh, ag let's say aggressively assimilationist uh, stance, which was that it would be better for everyone if uh, if even in private people uh, would just put away their um, their antiquated uh you know backward identities and join the modern uh chinese uh identity uh and the the state has never officially uh, changed its policy um and in fact reiterated a, 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 a sort of commitment to continuity uh with the sort of uh, framework that uh, Stalin laid out in 1913. But if you look at actual practice, uh, even in, in speeches of, uh, of Xi Jinping, there are sort of phrases that are lifted from articles by the, the two who's. And uh, the, the extra points on, on the college entry exam is being phased out. One child policy is already gone. So that special you know, exemption from it is no longer relevant. The, um, extra year, uh, possible year, but, but after high school and before college, that's also on the way out. Um, minority or uh, uh, teaching in the local language has been, has not been obliterated. It still exists to some extent, but has been quite radically curtailed. And um, uh, even in kindergarten now, uh, all, all teaching should be medium uh, of Chinese. So, um, so that's the, the state of play at the moment, which is more or less, a, let's say, a, an, an implicit repudiation of, um, of the, uh, the socialist approach to the nationality, uh, to, to the national question. Uh, but I want to sort of end by saying that, that uh, my own observation is that uh, this change in uh, nationalities policy is kind of linked to a broader embracing of the conceptualization of China as a nation state, which is which is part of this contradiction that emerged, uh, you know, from early on in social democracy. Um, and you know, Mao clearly thought of China as a nation state and thought that it was important for China to be strong as a nation state. Uh, and I think Xi Jinping is just applying the logic inherent in the social uh, form of the nation state that that um, that one state should have one nation. 
And the way to do that is either like in Austria, you break, you break up the Austrian empire and you say, okay, uh, the, the Czechs get their own nation and the Hungarians get their own nation. Or the other thing you can do is you can say everyone who belongs to a minority uh, a nation has to assimilate to the majority nation. And that's an another way that you can, you can get this one-to-one -one map between, um, between uh, the state and, and the nation. So, uh, you know, when we are tempted to critique uh, changes in, um, in Chinese nationalities policy, I, uh, you know, I would encourage us to understand that uh, in that critique should be a, a critique or, or may well be a critique of uh, the nation state as a, if you like, a technology of social political organization. Um, and that's, I think, where I uh, will end my talk. Thank you so much, Nathan, uh, for that most wide ranging and I have to say, uh, spellbinding uh, tour d'horizon is the only word that really comes to mind because you really span. I mean, I did say you were going to be taking us on a, on a journey. I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was going to be just quite as, um, as uh, expansive. For me, I mean, it really did uh, uh, ex certainly expand my horizons. So I'd just like to tell everybody that questions are um, really warmly uh, uh, invited. And the thing to do is to find your Q&A button on your screen and to type in your question there. This is a webinar format, so that's the best way of communicating your, your question. So um, I suppose I'm, I'm just going to actually do what I should have done already. I should have already opened. So I'm just opening my um, Q&A just to make sure that I don't miss any questions that, that are asked. And of course, I have one ready myself. Um, and it's, it's this question, uh, Nathan. I'm just wondering, I think it might be a little bit from left field, but still, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm just wondering, nowadays, do you think there is what could be called creolization going on um, in, in China? Um, and I'm not really thinking so much of languages as, you know, nations or cultures. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and sort of identifications and belongings. And that's, I suppose that's one half of the question. And the other half is, well, there are two other, there's, there, are th there are three thirds, if you like. So that's the first question, first uh, third. The second third is, is there, you know, is there, is this would this be linked to mobility? I mean, I know there are a lot of migrant workers in, in China and I'm just wondering, you know, about but I understood that that migration of workers was just for one year and then you would have to go back to base um, that you wouldn't be allowed to kind of migrate and settle. So to do it's got to do with maybe internal borders between these different languages and identification groups. And I did. Have, uh, there was a third element. Oh, yes, it's to do with visible difference. I mean, so people have in their heads what you described as, you know, let's say home languages, which don't really get, um, you know, which don't really, which they don't really necessarily associate with that much in the public sphere. But is there is there also, you know, um, a sort of a, a visible difference element to all of this? I'm sorry for throwing three at you. Oh, no, that's fine. I've, I, I've got it covered. OK, so um, I'll just start, even though you said not to take it uh, from a linguistic perspective, I will start with the, the, the linguistic perspective on creolization, which is that you know, e even at the sort of height of, um, uh, of um, 
uh, what to say, generosity on the part of the state vis-a-vis -vis, um, local languages like uh, sponsoring publications and having uh, local language education straight through university. Uh, it was a social reality that, you know, to get ahead in life, uh, uh, no, good knowledge of Chinese would be helpful. And for, 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 um, for certain kinds of interactions with the state or with commerce, uh, a good knowledge of Chinese was necessary. So um, under that context, uh, you started getting lots of loan words. Uh, and when I was in um, Lhasa in, in uh, 2001, it was clear that, uh, you know, although, uh, although there was there was no question that that the Tibetan was a thriving uh, language that that all of the vocabulary of uh, of modern life was sort of the default was Chinese and um, and I'll just give an example that I remember which is I was talking to to, to someone just uh, you know at a coffee shop or something and then and then she turned to someone to ask what the Tibetan in Tibetan, she asked what the Tibetan word for dictionary was using the Chinese word for dictionary. And that's a, a funny one to me because of course as a as a learner of Tibetan, that was certainly a word I knew. Yeah. Um, so that so that's so so creolization as a linguistic phenomenon is certainly going on. Uh, and then particularly in Amdo, there has been a sort of reaction against that uh, of like we we must you know not use uh, Chinese loan words and we must always find a Tibetan word uh, to use instead uh, and and that um, actually one thing to, to, to point out about that particular let's say manifestation of nationalism has has not I have not seen any uh, sense in which it's uh, threatened uh, uh, considered threat to 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 the to well to, to the state and maybe that's just because people people who don't speak in Tibetan don't even notice that it's happening, <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyhow that there is that sort of met that uh, very typical you know like a uh, like German in the in the early nineteenth century uh, let's get it rid of all the French loan words uh, so so that is going on specifically in Amdo in in in. In Tibet now the now on to migration the 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 you were referring to this um th so back in the day one of the ways that oops, so the, the the economic policy of, of during the Mao period was to basically ex extract resources from the countryside and to spend them on heavy industry in the cities uh, and that was done with with fixing prices uh, to to sort of make sure that happened you know keep agricultural products cheap keep industrial products expensive. Uh, but then what, what kept farmers from just moving to the city? Well, they had, they, you were, you were registered. You, everyone had their local registration and, and your work group leader had to approve, you know, your marriage, all sorts of things, right? So uh, that system is currently still in place. Uh, it, a lot of the powers associated with it have been loosened. Uh, but for instance, actually an amusing case is um, you oftentimes hear about how good math education is in Shanghai. Well, th th that math education is only measured on those people who, who have the right to live <laughs> in Shanghai, who go to these, these the, the actuals, who are allowed to go to school in Shanghai, uh, so, who are really an a, a elite group at this point, right? Uh, so, so you get this, this situation where people do migrate to the cities and they work as a kind of urban proletariat without any kind of legal standing and then they have to go home to the countryside for all of their or certain kinds of interactions with the state now in the old days one of the ways you would you would encourage uh, let's say chinese uh, colonization of peripheral regions is by uh, giving the people the right to change their locality of registration if they serve for a while you know, in out west, uh, and and this was I talked to some some people in 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 the early two thousands who were Chinese, who were taxi drivers or construction workers, uh, who availed themselves of this opportunity. Everyone hated all the Chinese people. They hated living in Tibet. They thought they, they, they didn't like the altitude. They didn't like the climate. They hated it. Um, but if I think you had to work there seven years, and then you had the the right to live anywhere in China. So then you would move to Beijing. So. The, the, that that's kind of that let's say to the extent that there was a policy of of demographic replacement and i don't know uh, whether there was or not uh, but it, it has been sort of successful but not super successful right um and now what you see happening especially in xinjiang 
is that if you uh, so so most people let's say most people have been released from the uh, vocational rehabilitation centers um, and uh, are either back home or are in actual prison and many of the the the, the, the internment centers have been turned into prisons uh, but also if you if you're unemployed in Xinjiang if you just sort of turn up at the you know the job center and say oh I'm unemployed they'll say well here's a bus to work in a factory in the east yeah uh, so th th there there is an attempt specifically with with uh, Uyghurs I don't know about other people uh, to to encourage let's say uh, migration out east um, and and the, and and then the who's uh, definitely promoted sort of inter international uh, uh, mingling as one way of withering away uh, national identity and so i think that well let's say one perspective on on both moving uh, or incentivizing han or han chinese people to move to the west and incentivizing uh, westerners to move back east uh, it might be, let's say, at the ideological level, this this inter uh, international uh, mingling. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, other people. We, we had this uh, this webinar a few months ago, and uh, this question came up uh, around the uh, around the Uyghurs. Uh, other people would say it's it's partly a, a way of uh, in in the context of rising wages in China over over overall. It's a way of maintain maintaining a kind of uh, proletarian working class by, by let's say, ethnicizing that class. So, and then that kind of turns uh, nicely to your third uh, point, which is kind of the the meaning of phenotype. Uh, where let's say, and, and I haven't heard much discussion about this in China, but I have one friend whose prediction is uh, that, or 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 he says, look at the U.S. In the U.S., we were we were able to take uh, people from. Uh, another continent, and uh, and strip them of their language, of their religion, uh, of of any kind of uh, continuity of culture, uh, and uh, and treat them as property. Yeah, uh, and and yet they have not, uh, you know, fully assimilated into the majority group. Yeah, and, and that that might, to some extent, have to do with a, a sort of phenotypical. Uh, uh, identifiability uh, but I think it, it's also just clearly really useful for 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 capitalism yeah <laughs> um, so so my friend's prediction is that is that a consequence of this approach of everyone speak Chinese everyone you know stop being your your Buddhist or Muslim or whatever you have to be you know be Chinese speak Chinese eat Chinese food it, it doesn't, it won't necessarily obliterate uh, national identity, yeah. I mean, I, I would be tempted to say, of course, that Ireland has some experience with this vis-a-vis -vis the UK. <laughs> you know, we're speaking English right now, and, and why is that, you know? Um, but, uh, but, you know, the UK, despite, uh, you know, spending a thousand years and a great deal of time and effort and money on on uh, facing the Irish nation, they, they weren't uh, su su successful, right? So, uh, and, and and let's say again, using a sort of you know uh, Marxist terminology, I would say in a, in a dialectical way, the more heavy-handed your efforts uh, to to efface uh, national identity are, the more likely that that will provoke dialectically a, 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 a an, an assertion of of difference. Thank you so much for that for that wonderful answer, uh, Nathan. And I see that there is a, um, another question. You're not going to get much rest. Um, so this is a question from uh, uh, now Nori Kodate. So it's uh, China's approach to the national question. To what extent has it been shaped by globalization? In many Western nations, the nation state model has been challenged in recent years due to globalization. And so we have the erosion of uh, national autonomy um, in uh, the shaping of domestic economy, uh, for example. And uh, now is wondering if there is something different and unique happening in China, you know, due to its position in the world. So that's his question. 
So we might have to kind of, you know, sit around and have a beer to, 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 to scratch under the surface of that question. But it, it seems to me like the, the, the well, there, there, are two, there are two things that are, well, yeah, no. Well, here's a, here's a few thoughts. Certainly, um, uh, immigration uh, has an effect on the national question, you know? So like in, in Ireland now, you have a lot of Brazilians and you have a lot of uh, Nigerians and whatnot. And, and I think that that uh, implicitly is a challenge to, to the notion of a nation state. I think it's generally understood that, that newcomers should assimilate somehow. Yeah, that, that there's some, that's the kind of American model that Mao Rong was promoting. Uh, of course, you know, with people who, who have uh, not chosen to move somewhere, for, but have always lived there, <laughs> like the, the Mongols in Mongolia, um, that's a different question. And, and actually some American uh, scholars think that we should not talk about uh, uh, Chinese nationalities policy, but, but instead talk about indigenous peoples and indigenous rights. I sort of feel like the discourse of indigeneity kind of accepts the inevitability of, uh, of, 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 of one particular nation winning <laughs> and, and, and the other ones not winning in, in a way that I'm a little uncomfortable with, but I understand, which is why I tried to really tell this story uh, from, from the perspective of you know, China's own ideology, which is a social democracy. Uh, the, the other thing that, you know, that could be being mentioned is that, um, is that I think it's clear that, uh, I don't know, let's say the Bretton Woods institutions uh, are used to constrain the sovereignty of post-colonial nation states uh, in, in some kind of ersatz colonialism uh, that we call <laughs> globalization. Uh, and it's clear that, that China is, is, is smart about <laughs> interacting with that uh, regime, let's say. And, and the way I think of it is that, that Western governments think that the political exists inside of the economic so that that, that kind of the relations of production you know cannot be politically questioned you know, this is the, the 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 sort of thatcherite you know there is no alternative right uh, whereas in china they may they may love their international capitalism uh, but they know the political is the wider circle and the economic exists at the at the leisure if you like of the political and, and, and we'll use the economic as a political tool. Thanks very much, Nathan. Um, I don't think there are any other questions in, in the chat and it is uh, one minute past seven. Uh, I was just wondering if I could just ask one last question and it's, it's, it's a sort of fairly um, limited one, but it's just, it, it, it really is uh, sort of pressing on my mind. Um, is there, do you, do you think that there is a sense in China that, you know, being multilingual is sort of in any way a positive thing? And if so, what would be the languages that it would be really good to be multilingual in, you know? Uh, the answer is unambiguously English. Yeah. That, um... Uh, you have to study a, a foreign language uh, in in high school uh, in in China, and there's a, a limited list. It's something like English, German, French, Spanish, and Japanese. But uh, for, you know, uh, effectively, everyone chooses uh, English. There, there is some indication really just in the last year that um, that let's say if China is really going to be a kind of systemic rival to the United States then then in, then English can't be as important as it has been in in China uh, so so in particular I forget whether it's grade school in in Shanghai you know no longer they're no longer teaching English uh, and that's considered a sort of uh, you know, a, a, a sign of the changing winds. There's been a discussion for a long time about uh, uh, not requiring it uh, for university entrance uh, exams. 
but I don't think there's any there's any sign that let's say that discussion has gotten more active and more loud, but I don't think there's any sign that policy will be changing on that. Right. And do, would you see any, the, sorry, a follow up question, but just would you see, is there any sort of natural competitor in that out of that list to English? You no. know, if, if, no, it's Chinese if it's not English, you know, oh. there's. There's, I think there's, yeah, I don't want to sort of fall into a certain kind of discourse. It's becoming quite uh, common now, but it, it's clear that uh, that uh, that Chinese is, as China becomes more important economically, politically, in 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 academia. You know, let's. I'm just talk personally. You know, when I decided to, to learn Chinese or Japanese first, I chose Japanese because the quality of scholarship coming out of Japan at the time was much higher than that that was coming out of China. Um, and uh, the quality of scholarship coming out of Japan has not gone down, <laughs> uh, but the quality of scholarship coming out of China has gone way up and, and also way up in quantity. So, so I think that, um, you know, Ch China, as China becomes a more important uh, country on the global stage, Chinese becomes a more important language on the global stage. But on the other hand, actually, if you look at, like, like really in the hard sciences, it, kind of 15 years ago, people still wrote in Chinese, maybe because they just didn't have the knowledge to write in English, whereas now, uh, the, the language of, of publication of academic work, it, especially in the sciences, is, is, is English. But I mean, I think that's comparable to Germany, for instance, whereas Germany doesn't see it as a particular threat that English is the lingua franca of, of I don't know, the global. Right. Thanks for that. Um, so I don't think there are any more questions. So I think it really just remains for me to um, to uh, free you, uh, Nathan, after um, you've really given us enormous uh, value for that was a, that was a, an um, extraordinarily um, illuminating um, an extraordinarily illuminating talk, and it kept going. It just kept going uh, right through the, the answers to those questions. So. I really want to thank you so much for having uh, accepted that invitation though all those months ago and all I can say is it was worth the wait. Oh well thank That's you so much. So, so thank you thank you so much and of course I'm just